the, uh, the topic for my talk is looking at the smart home. So hands up, who has a smart home technology? And that's not my boss, you don't count. Who else? How much explaining do I need to do? So I work in the smart home group at Intel and my interest in this topic is really about how would the smart home industry look today if women were in charge? And I, I did some Googling <laughs> on the future smart home um, and looked back in time to see some imaginary designs. I love this one, but is this an answer? Would the smart home just be pink? <laughs> That's a simple answer. But there's also a common desire, I think, in the imaginary of engineers is that we will get robots to do the housework. So that's another reason why the talk is looking at whether a smart home will eventually do my laundry. I think these are recurring desires in the way that we think about the future of technology and the home, because in many ways, it's easier to imagine a robot doing the laundry than changing the domestic gender division of labor. Um, so I'm really here to figure out how long we're gonna take to ch change that conversation about who is doing the work in the home. What I'm gonna show you today is some material you may not have seen before. It's like the hidden history of women's work engineering the household. So I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of figures from this history in management studies in engineering and science and tech where women have been consultants to industry for actually over a century. Um, so I'm hoping that will help us think about including more women in tech today because I think we're at a bit of a turning point as these technologies are built, as decisions are being made by engineers about what work is being automated in the home. It's important for us to draw on this history of women's expertise. But before I go into that, I want to give you a little bit of background about me. So you heard I'm from Down Under. I'm actually from Australia and the island at the bottom of Australia, Tasmania. And actually this photo is taken from the beach where I grew up, which is an island at the bottom of that island. So Down Under, Down Under, Down Under. And when my mom and dad moved to this island, one of the things that my mom did at the local school was she taught home economics. And she didn't really learn how to cook growing up because my grandfather was like in charge of the kitchen. <laughs> so what she did to learn how to teach home economics was consult these kinds of manuals. Um, the one you see here on the left is the 21st birthday cookery book of the Country Women's Association of Tasmania, which is a support and volunteer network of women in country areas in Australia. It's one of the hugest women-only networks in Australia, which is developed during the war years to help isolated country women learn how to run the household when they've got no access to resources, when they've got no local shop, when they don't have an Amazon delivery van coming down the street helping them with the nappies. But this history of women's expertise in the home is cross-cultural, Mrs. Beaton's in the UK. And here in the US, which I learned when I was writing my book about the history of productivity, this amazing manual, Americans, uh, American Woman's Home was Catherine Beecher and her sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who some of you may know if you have literature backgrounds. All of these manuals have the same kinds of function of transmitting knowledge and expertise and, and taste and judgment and the, for, the forms of management expertise that women have always cultivated and shared with each other, often as gifts. And 100 years ago, the household for many women was an enterprise. These are the org charts from Lippincott's home manual where you see, well, as Intel employees, we would recognize an org chart, <laughs> but what you see at the top is a housewife, or what I like to call, based on one of our earlier conversations this morning, a lady boss <laughs> in charge of the domestic enterprise. So you'll see in these manuals, they're fascinating documents because they enumerate the number of tasks that can be done in the household, but can also be delegated. So what you're seeing here 
in the org chart are the tasks, the roles and responsibilities for one domestic employee. This one assumes you have two domestic employees. And what I like about these is that they're anticipating the logic that we now take for granted, that there are certain things that you can delegate to an assistant. This is really what we're continuing when we're building smart home technologies to take over some of the work for us. So how fascinating that this is 100 years ago. Also at the turn of the last century, one of my favorite stories that I've found in my research on productivity is this icon, Lillian Gilbreth, who was the first woman to be elected to the National Academy of Engineering in the, in the States. She was the first female engineer professor at Purdue University, and she was one of the first consultants to industry as a social scientist. She was the wife of Frank Gilbreth, and together they were the ones you may know from the story Cheaper by the Dozen. They had 12 children, and one of the things they did as time and motion experts was to test out their theories of household efficiency with their kids. <laughs> They had Gantt charts to understand all of the different tasks in the household, including children's teeth brushing. And then one of the things that Lillian did after her husband passed away was to take over this consultancy business and she interviewed 4,000 housewives to General Electric to find out what they needed in the home. So Lillian designed the shelves in your fridge. She has the patent for the egg holder in your fridge and the butter dish and the pedal bin. So one of the things we do in the smart home team is thinking, think about how voice assistance makes us hands-free. You know, having Alexa to talk to you about our tasks frees up your hands to do more multitasking in the home. Lillian Gilbreth was doing this 100 years ago. And here is her prototype management desk for the home on the right here, where you're seeing all of the different reference books and files and forms and typewriter you might be able to see in the middle to do all of the household management. That was her prototype for IBM. Another household engineer who I love to talk about is Christine Frederick, who some of you may know about from her Ladies Home Journal columns. She was also a consultant to industry and had her own test kitchen in her house. And what she did was apply efficiency principles to the home and the design of the kitchen. So there's a lot of talk about food here yesterday at TechFest. Here is the revised housewife steps of a kitchen that has been redesigned to have the triangle that we know today of the most efficient way to move from the bench to the oven to the sink so that you reduce the number of steps in your day. It's this idea of household engineering Christine Frederick wrote a course about this and then published a book called Household Engineering that you can get very easily online. It's a massive history of expertise that we don't draw on very much when we're talking about smart home today. In fact, if you look at who is the most likely purchaser of a smart home device, you'll see here the numbers from PwC are weighted in a particular way. As a gender studies person, you note very quickly that there's 30% of women who do not own or plan to own a smart home device. This is curious to me, given how much women have been central to not only home management in the past, but these ideas of efficiency. So what's changed in 100 years? This graph is trying to show you what's changed. We've had a massive influx of women into paid work, and we haven't really talked about what's happened to households since that happened, right? So that's 1948 to 2018. Blue is men's employment in the USA and red is women, okay? You'll also note there's a downtick from 2008, nobody's <laughs> working so much. And some women are even going to stay home now because they're finding that they can't get those jobs that they had um, before the recession. So there's a lot of chaos in home space today. These are some of the books, including my own, that have written about this and how technology is really, for many people, exacerbating that feeling of stress um, and the way that in which work and home life is colliding, you know, and the, the solutions that people have for bringing work and home life together are often, if you've seen this video of uh, a father who was doing a live broadcast uh, on BBC and his children burst in 
um, and then his wife came in to try and get them off the live broadcast. People are really struggling with the ways in which professional life and home life are bleeding into each other. This idea of presence bleed is something that I've written about. These are the people that should be most helped by smart technologies, I think. And then one of the things we do as social scientists at Intel is we go and look at how those experiences compare with others in different parts of the world, where in this case, a working mom in Shanghai is working from that bedroom, her childhood bedroom, in her parents' house, from that desk, <laughs> with her baby's crib next to her, and her childhood bed next to that. Next door, her grand the grandparents of the kid are looking after her child, and she's juggling all of these different roles in this house that's not even her house. What she does is she uses smart home technology, these cameras here, like on the, one, on the left, to make sure that the house she's not in is safe while she's working from home at her parents' house. And we've also interviewed a bunch of mums in Shanghai who are using smart home technologies not only to monitor the baby, but to monitor the servants that are looking after the baby. Um, and on the right, um, that's what you're seeing. A lot of those technologies in the middle are um, nanny cams that busy mums are using to make sure that um, their staff in the new domestic enterprise are looking after their children while they can't. And I love this image here on the left of um, one of the mums we interviewed last year who's using her voice assistant in the bedroom with her baby so that she can rock her baby to sleep. Um, so that's one of the things that I really like doing for Intel, is bringing these women's stories to bear on the sorts of technologies that we're building. And in the smart home team, we're trying to reincorporate some of this uh, women's expertise as carers, as nurturers, um, as people who get things done in the house, right? Um, who see the house as a location for productivity and multitasking as much as leisure but also keeping that connection with kids. Playing lullabies and nursery rhymes is one of the most popular applications of Alexa right now. And it's important that we realize that these are the things that people are using the technology for, for good. Okay, so I promised robots in this talk. Um, there is a laundry folding robot. It exists, you can Google it. And I really like this article which shows um, why it might be important given the stats I just showed you about how everybody is working outside the home now, who's gonna be doing the work um, when we're, sh we're still not uh, recognizing that work. We need to make sure that women's voices are included in the design of technology because women know the work that's getting done. What we're challenged by now is that I'm not sure robots are gonna change this image if all of us are using our devices to be connected to work all the time how is our attention being split? I also think this robot has some plans. He looks a bit suspicious to me. And my bet, going back to some other feminist history, which I'll leave you with, is that if we make our technologies so smart that they are able to do housework for us, this is an image from the Wages for Housewives campaign of the 1970s, right? Where women were finally recognizing that their unpaid work in the home was not being realized in economic value. I think maybe if there's good to be found in smart home technologies, it will be that robots will start to strike back <laughs> and may not be able to um, put up with some of this drudgery of housework that we've been doing for many years. So I'm going to leave you with that image of what will happen when the robots revolt against housework. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. This has been such a nice conference. Yes. Um, okay, wait. So I want to start with the fact that I am very nervous just in general about smart homes. I like my home to be as dumb as possible. We recently got a, a trash can that's a smart trash can, and it responds to, you have to say open can, which to me is oh. like terrifying. Okay. So, but w what would you say to someone who is nervous about the idea of a smart home and maybe wants to go back in time? Well, first I would say, no problem, that's fine. Smart home technology is not compulsory. 
it is not required that you move from the pedal bin. I think the pedal bin is one of the most amazing inventions. Um, it was invented by a woman, and that's another bonus. And I think there's a tendency, especially in the early adopter market for smart home right now, that it attracts a certain kind of techie type, someone who's digitally literate, who likes playing with things, and unlike most other technologies that have been brought into the home, it, it is showing already statistically that men are the ones that are purchasing tech. It's because it, it fits with a kind of tinkering, hobbyist, mm. garage kind of practice that has often been the thing that men do at home. But at the same time, when we're talking about whether it's possible to resist or refuse what's going on, it's happening anyway, right? I mean, and, and what you count as a smart device in your home, does it also include your phone? Does it also include your PC? Like, there are already technologies doing a lot of the same things that what's called smart technology is doing. So it's really hard to draw the line. Yeah, so my phone is already listening to me. It I doesn't matter if the trash can is too. I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's a sort of monogamy idea that we have with devices that we only need one or we only want one. <laughs> but in reality, there are many <laughs> devices talking to each other behind our back. I like the monogamy theory of hey, devices. Hey, it's the gender studies background. It gets me every time. Um, give me, I'm, I'm a really positive person, so give me the dystopia. Give me the dystopia if the smart home continues to be almost exclusively designed by men. What does it look like? I mean, um, are we in it now? Or, or could it get stranger? <laughs> could it get stranger? The thing I've noticed, I've been in the smart home team um, for about a year, and the thing I've noticed is that there's a very strong dimension to the industry that's focused on security, like protecting the home. And you get that with some of the investments in doorbells and cameras that are externally focused. They're about recognizing a threat, okay? An intruder, someone who's gonna come through the threshold that's not auth authorized to do so. Yeah. So my dystopia would be that if men are setting up the devices or the protectors of the family are setting up the devices and the rest of the family aren't informed about how those decisions are made, what happens if that protector becomes a threat? So, oh my God, that's there terrifying. are very large divorce statistics in this country. That's literally the scariest thing you've ever said. <laughs> so, so what happens if the man has the control over the setting and decides who comes to the house? That is the dystopia, okay. That is my 100% nightmare. what we're building right now, but it is the extension of the logic. What about though just, I mean, would you say it's problematic or is it kind of fine that like all of the smart devices have female names and speak in female voices? Um, to me, that feels like it's raising a generation of people who um, interact with female voices in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, mm -hmm. D does that worry you? Or There's do you a think really I, good I'm poem overthinking? about this in The Atlantic by my friend Ian Bogost, who he's pointed out that you can change the voice right? You can change it from being female voice. You can have a male. You can have a different accent. So I could have my Aussie, as you would say. But the thing is, the default is female. And if you ask some of the companies, they will say, well, it's a genderless assistant. Mm. I think for me as a social scientist, how I okay, think Alexa about it. Alexa is not genderless. Alexa is obviously... I mean, depending Alexa on your language Alex. background, A, will, it will mean feminine as opposed to Alex. But I think what we're really talking about is who are we comfortable talking to and why is it that women's voices seem to be more comforting, receiving commands? And you have heard probably anecdotes of people who say, like, they try and get their kids to say please after they ask Alexa to do something. But I think there is a long history, just like I showed in that chart, of delegation and for many years, in many workplaces, that delegation has been to women. It's the secretary, you know, <laughs> from the old days of the office. So we do have to be careful when we're thinking about what the default mode is because it sends a message. Yeah. 
where are we in the history right now? Because what was interesting to me about your presentation is it seems like women were developing the home a lot and then now kind of men are both developing these home gadgets and then also buying them. Like, is right now uh, an enormous pivot in the home or is this sort of just a, a blip that's happening? Where, contextualize us right now. Yeah, for me, this is the exciting time to get involved. Like, this is why I wanted to work in this group because we have what's once in a generation, I think, a new kind of interface happening, which is the voice interface. You can talk to an object and it will give you information and you don't have to type anything. This to me is one of the most democratic opportunities for computing that we're gonna see in our lifetime because there's gonna be kids growing up who never have to open a laptop and type in a password to get access to information. And also, um, as we're already seeing in our research, we've got kids talking to their grandparents through voice and through the Echo Show through vision too, seeing each other without having to go through the sorts of digital literacies and, and keyboard competence that has been confronting for some people in the past. Mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been an obstacle and a barrier for people to feel like technology is friendly and, and in touch with some of those family-oriented uses. But now I think it's potentially gonna make it easier for people. Yeah. Um, we're going to go to questions in just a bit, so if anyone, start thinking of questions. Um, what, okay, so you are a feminist theorist with a PhD. Correct. And Intel hired you to bring you in. <laughs> were, were they, I know your boss is right here, so you don't, but were they nervous bringing you in and, 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 and having someone with that skill set and the, the, that sort of lens looking at what they're working on? I think my job is to make people nervous where I work. Um, I was also hired by a feminist, Genevieve Bell, who I know has spoken at TechFest in the past. So the thing that gives me a lot of confidence um, to continue to ask the hard, hard questions of our engineers and our marketing team and everybody else involved in spreading this technology and its uses is just to say, who are you designing for? And I continue a long tradition, like Lillian Gilbreth started, of human factors engineering and human-computer interaction is the dynamic that we are in charge of building. So I want to make sure we're thinking of every possible user who can be empowered by the technology once we're making those decisions that lock in ideal types and ideal use cases, as engineers will call it. Um, it's critical to make sure that you have people with cultural expertise mm. to make sure that products can make sense to people beyond the regular idea of a user in tech. And that's what we're here talking about today. It's all about inclusion. Yeah. Audience questions. Maybe I was too scary. <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> oh, wait, I think there are There's mics mic. somewhere. Here, come, yeah. come on up, come to a mic. I'm curious if in your research you've found a new definition of the home or the workplace? What a question, thank you. I think for me, we're seeing a number of shifts. I tried to indicate this in the little uh, flip after 2008, where we're starting to see particular kinds of paid employment going down for both men and women. I think we're seeing a return to the home as the domestic enterprise, not just the place where you leave work and go home and have your leisure, but it's also the place where more and more people are stitching together a livelihood. Because this, this move towards unstable gig work is not changing. Um, it's the legacy of the 2008 crash. You've got more and more people looking for places to work um, but can't afford or can't get hired to work in a traditional office. So I don't, I don't know if it's changing so much as we're seeing a return to what the house used to be, which is this home from many forms of activity. That's why I love that uh, org chart, you know, because I think we're going to see the 20th century as having been a blip where people left to go to work on the freeway in suburbia, if you're at Intel, <laughs> or in the city, <laughs> if you're in Manhattan, and then you go back to the home. I think that's also, for lots of reasons, a good shift because it's also going to have massive impact on the way that we save 
energy, we can spend more time with our families, we don't have to be juggling these incompatible roles and responsibilities that were the legacy of the corporation. Mm. More questions? Come on. You got more. <laughs> well, I got more, I've got a thousand. Most I wanna go back to my dystopia vision. <laughs> yeah, that could get dangerous. Here we go, we got one. I've got a, I've got a dystopia question. <coughs> Excellent. Uh, what is the role of design ethics when we are designing tools for the home that we sign into some social contract with for monitoring babies, for giving voice commands, uh, but the makers and designers of that technology intend to use that data to monetize it off of patterns and behavior similar to Facebook and Cambridge Analytica? How do we encourage design ethics as part of the creative design process mm -hmm. for a smart home? Great question. Obviously, it's critical. The, the thing I often say at work when we're talking about designing for the home is this is the most intimate environment. So this is the place where people do not expect that this data will be going beyond the threshold that they determine, right? So I think in particular, the idea of literacy when we're moving into a data economy is critical. That's why I'm very passionate about making sure that locally here in Portland, we're I improving some of those education outreach programs, that bringing the tech industry and community closer to the education process here in Portland. Because we, we have a mainstream user base for some of the most popular platforms like Facebook, as you mentioned, uh, that may not know what's going on at the back end, may not know or have the control over the tools that are then making you the product of the platform. So we've got a lot of, I think, credibility in this space in terms of having social scientists working on privacy and ethics issues with AI. In fact, one of, one of my colleagues is going to that conference on Monday to present the work that we do because we're not only sensitive to what privacy means in a US setting, okay, because privacy has a particular history here, but internationally, you know, we're already seeing in Europe, for example, a lot more regulatory clout coming down on Silicon Valley companies, and that's because cultural studies background will um, make me sort of bring this up, but privacy is itself relative um, from a cultural point of view. But to have that expertise in-house and talking directly with the engineers about what's appropriate use, what's contextual integrity for when data is being generated and then transmitted, the onus is on us, I think, to educate the mainstream user on what's appropriate for them to be able to know and then share. Because the, the thing is, if we don't do that work, we're, we're gonna see the sorts of things that have happened recently with our colleagues. Yeah. I think we're out of time. What? Already? This was okay. great, though. Well, thank you. Thank you Ooh, so much for coming. Thank you for <laughs> Are you going to stay? <laughs>